Uh, welcome. Um, I'm John Huth. Um, I'm with the physics department and also the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Um, so let me just say a few words about Radcliffe. Um, we have multiple programs here, um, and its mission is um, explicitly to be cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, uh, which distinguishes it from other institutes for advanced study. Uh, and it's uh, to be engaged in this um, institution is um, been just amazing for me uh, because I've learned all sorts of things that I wouldn't thought <laughs> I would have learned. I'm a particle physicist by trade, and um, I get into all sorts of topics like the oceans, for example. Um, we have many programs. It includes a fellowship program. Uh, where people uh, can come and spend a year here um, with uh, scientists, playwrights, uh, people in the humanities, artists. Uh, there's a Schlesinger Library, um, and uh, it's um, dedicated to the history of women in America. Um, I'm a member of the Ventures faculty, which runs uh, a number of programs, inclu including exploratory seminars, which are meant to be uh, interdisciplinary, workshops, and uh, science symposia. And this coming year, our science symposium is on the oceans, uh, looking at very aspects, various aspects of oceans, like the uh, early life in the oceans, um, where it came from, life in hydrothermal vents, for example, um, and also the outsized role that oceans play in our climate. Um, we also um, will be having a series of lectures. The Ocean Symposium is on October 28th. Uh, our kickoff lecture is Monday, October 24th by Carrie, Carrie Emanuel, who is a uh, climatologist, uh, meteorologist expert uh, from MIT, who came up with the concept of a hypercane, which is a, uh, a hurricane that will occur if the sea temperatures rise about 15 degrees C, and has predicted that with um, warming oceans, uh, the frequency of hurricanes will decrease, but their intensity will increase tremendously. Uh, so that's on October uh, 24th. Um, what we have here is our kickoff event of uh, a series that is called Next in Science. And um, the idea is that we're going to bring early career scientists uh, to talk about their work uh, to a general audience. And um, I guess this is in part motivated by uh, what I've observed that a lot of the interesting new science is happening at the intersection between disciplines, uh, always has. And oftentimes, the way universities are set up with uh, departments, the departments can sometimes be somewhat stovepiped and miss opportunities. And in fact, a lot of young scientists uh, tend to gravitate to work um, that tends to be at the boundaries of disciplines. And so in a way, um, by exposing Harvard and the public to uh, their work, uh, we are trying to educate ourselves about uh, new areas, uh, emerging areas in the sciences, uh, in addition to um, getting some exposure to the young scientists. Um, just as an example, um, in my own discipline, particle physics, which is, um, I would say, rather mature at this point, it had its start in um, study, well, one of the starts in experimental particle physics um, was in the study of clouds. There were various theories about how clouds formed. One of them was accretion around dust particles. Another was around charged particles in the atmosphere. And um, cloud chambers were invented basically to try to make clouds. And as uh, an accidental uh, result, uh, people were able to find charged particles using clouds. And so there you have sort of a funny accidental uh, cross-disciplinary work that um, absolutely innovated the field of particle physics. So um, as I said, we focus on early career scientists, and we try to have a theme. Uh, keeping in the theme with um, the oceans, uh, we decided to gather together four uh, outstanding uh, scientists, early career scientists, uh, to talk about their work in the oceans. And since I helped organize this, I had, um, I guess, the privilege of picking the topics that I found the most interesting and the speakers that I found the most interesting. Uh, even though you might not realize it, we did a little homework before we asked you to come. But uh, So um, the format is we'll have two uh, approximately 30-minute talks. Hold your questions for them. We'll then go to questions from the audience, uh, take a break, and then come back for two more um, talks. 
Um, and um, I think they'll be fascinating. At least I'm going to be on the edge of my seat uh, listening. So um, the first speaker today is um, Dr. Rachel Gitman, who is from the Marine Science Center at Northeastern University and got her doctorate at uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and is going to talk on um, the subject of shorelines. Um, I'll just say some words about why I get interested in these things, but since I'm a, a sea kayaker, I spend a lot of time on the coast, and I'm always looking at the dynamics of what's happening on shorelines and why the sand's going away here and going over there, and uh, also uh, pondering why um, some large jetty is cracking apart and the, the sand is all disappearing behind that jetty, which was supposed to hold back um, uh, the sand from erosion. And um, so Rachel is going to talk about this topic. Um, and the title of her talk is Living Shorelines, uh, Are We Designing Functional, Sustainable, and Resilient Coasts? Rachel. Well, thank you for that introduction. And thank you all for coming today. Um, so just a little background since this is kind of a diverse group. I'm an ecologist by training. I'm going to start kind of with some ecology and because this is an interdisciplinary talk, kind of move into a tiny, tiny bit of the engineering side um, and then into some social science. So our coastlines are incredibly diverse, not just in the US, um, but globally. Um, they can encompass your ocean shorelines like your sand beaches your rocky shores, and also your sheltered coastlines like your coastal uh, tidal marshes and also mangroves. Um, and they're incredibly value, valuable systems. So they encompass only about 4% of the actual land on Earth, but they're extremely valuable um, in terms of their goods and services that they provide. So there's been several studies looking at ecosystem services pro provided by um, our coastlines, and they just come out disproportionately above a lot of our other um, terrestrial ecosystems. And one of these services that, that I think about a lot is this service of providing habitat to marine organisms. And so our coastal um, habitats, such as mangroves, marshes, and also our open coast shorelines, um, they really serve as a nursery. They serve as a, a habitat through all life history stages for lots of marine organisms. And most importantly for people, they serve as habitat for a lot of commercially and recreationally valuable fish. Um, so you might recognize, if you're from New England, cod. Um, cod actually spends some of their life history in shallow, rocky, uh, cobble bottom habitats, also seagrass habitats. Um, this fish is actually really famous in North Carolina, the red drum or redfish, also in the Gulf Coast, spends a lot of its early life history in seagrasses and marshes. Um, and these are some juveniles of speckled trout black sea bass, and then also snapper that'll, that are often pulled right out of some really tidal, uh, tidally shallow salt marshes in North Carolina. And then I throw this one in. This is actually in the Galapagos. These are bacalao or grouper. Um, they actually, in their early life history stages, are using mangrove habitats in the Galapagos. So globally, um, these habitats, these nearshore habitats, are incredibly important for our fisheries. They're highly productive. In the US alone, roughly 75% of all of the fishes that are commercially or recreationally harvested depend on estuarine or these shallow uh, nearshore habitats at one or more of their life history stages. So these habitats are incredibly valuable, but they're also um, imperiled. So we've seen unprecedented um, degradation and loss of our vegetated near coastal habitats from a quarter to nearly half of these habitats globally have been lost. And we've even seen greater losses with some of our um, reefs, our shellfish reefs like oysters and also our coral reefs. And there's a number of factors at play here. Um, so you'll hear about climate change in, these, uh, in the talks today, but you'll also um, need to think about all of the other human factors that are at play here. And coastal development is one that I think about a lot because we are right along the coast. And I like to put this slide up because this is actually, um, this is Dubai. So, um, not only are they developing their coastline, they're actually creating coastline to then provide waterfront um, development. So they're dredging up the sand and building islands so that people can have waterfront properties. So you can imagine that that has pretty dire ecological, um, also physical consequences for those coastlines and those habitats. Um, and so we might say, well, that's Dubai. We, you know, we don't do that kind of thing here. But that's actually not true. So this is. 
actually a shot I took flying in to Logan um, on one of my trips back up to Boston. And you know, it's a pretty densely populated coastline, right? So New England's got a lot of people, and we love our coast. Um, everyone loves Cape Cod. Um, and, and these resources are, are valued just for recreation and tourism. But obviously, having this many people living along the coastline can have some real consequences for those ecosystems. Now, in a, a natural setting with devoid of people, there are a fair number of stressors that occur for these coastal ecosystems. So this is actually a salt marsh in North Carolina. And this is a, this is a coarse sound, so it's a pretty large sound. It's shallow, but when you get the wind blowing from the right direction, the fetch is very large, or the distance across the sound is fairly large. And you'll get a significant amount of wave energy hitting these, these coastal habitats, these marshes. And so they erode over time, and they essentially roll back up into the uplands as they erode. And so this is a dynamic, natural process. Shorelines erode, they move around. As John was kind of alluding to, sand is not, you know, it's not static, it's not staying in one place. And so this is not really something we're concerned about as scientists, that, that we have erosion or that uh, this marsh is going to flood at high tide. These are all natural processes. It's really um, when we have kind of the loss of these habitats then tied to human infrastructure that people st really start to worry about it. Um, because these systems are going to persist through time. Geologic history has shown us. We still have salt marshes. We're going to continue to have salt marshes. Um, but it's really when we, as humans, come in and we draw a line in the sand and we say, this is my waterfront property. I want it to stay here for my lifetime that we start to see an issue. And this is a picture I took. This is in Dauphin Island, Alabama. So people have decided that they want to live right on the water, and over time, the ocean is eroded away the sand and their house is going to fall in the, river, in the water. And this is actually not inhabited anymore. I mean, there's caution tape. They're not allowed to go. And this is up and down the coast. It's not just from hurricanes. It's actually just poor zoning and poor planning. And this is a picture from New Bern, North Carolina. So this was actually last year. They had a tremendous amount of rainfall in the fall. And then you also tend to have these really high, high tides or king tides in the fall. Um, and so this is just a normal day where the high tide has come in and completely flooded the downtown area. And this is a pretty regular occurrence now. And this happens in Boston. It happens on you know, cities throughout the East Coast. So that's why we have to, to kind of take a step back and say, OK, we're doing all of this development. We, we want to live along the coast. Um, you know, over a third of the global population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. And people are moving towards the coast. So these, these numbers are going to increase. What can we really do, or, or how can we live along the coast and also protect this infrastructure? Well, historically, what we have done, at least um, the last, I would say, 100, 150 years in the US, has been to harden the shoreline. So the US Army Corps of Engineers, um, they have done tremendous things in our country in terms of redirecting rivers and also hardening our shorelines. So they build these seawalls, they'll build groins and jetties, the, the big shore perpendicular uh, rock structures you often see at inlets. Um, the idea is that you'll engineer your way out of this problem of coastal hazards, this problem of erosion, or this problem of flooding. And so that's really what we've done in the past. We've built seawalls. This is one um, actually at um, Lindshore Drive, so up near Swampscott, if you know that area. This is a riprap revetment, so it's just essentially rock piled up along the shore. And then this is actually a breakwater, so again, rock, and in this case, it's actually marl, actually placed uh, seaward of a tidal salt marsh. And so I'll actually talk about these structures in the terms of calling them a living shoreline a little bit later in the talk. But these are the two more traditional types of hardening um, that I really focus on with, with my work. So in starting to think about this issue, um, when I was starting graduate school, I wanted to do work on understanding the ecology or you know, what was happening when you hardened the shoreline to these nearshore habitats. The first question I really have is, well, how much does this happen? How much hardening do we actually have in the United States? I thought this would be an easy number that I could look up. It turns out we had no idea. Um, so after scouring a lot of data sets, I actually came across a NOAA data set that was used for oil spill response, where they'd classified different shoreline types. But they had never actually thought to, to do the math and to actually figure out how much of this was actually artificial shoreline. Um, and so I did that essentially for them. 
And so what I found is that, well, if we just take a, a subset of this um, shoreline and we look just at New England, I figured out that about 10% of the shoreline from Connecticut to Maine is hardened. Um, and so this is a, a map showing kind of the warm colors being a higher percentage of the shoreline that's actually hardened relative to the total amount of shoreline, cool colors being less. It shouldn't be any surprise that the Boston area is fairly uh, highly hardened. And if you look at the U.S. as a whole, it's roughly 14% of the U.S. coastline. This is about 22,000 kilometers, roughly 14,000 miles. And I had a colleague actually say that it's essentially like saying a, you take one in six steps and you could encounter a hardened shoreline, which I thought was kind of a neat way to think about it. Um, and so 14% might not seem like a whole lot, but when you think about how much coast we actually have, it's a pretty substantial number. And it's likely to increase given the number of people that are moving to the coast. Um, and so I did a series of analyses to kind of figure out what's most correlated with shoreline hardening. And it's no surprise that you know, housing density is positively correlated with shoreline hardening. The more people you have, the more houses you have, the more hardening you have. Um, so if you look at predictions for population growth, what we see is that really it's the South Atlantic and the Gulf Coast are predicted to see the largest increases in population in the coming uh, decades. So we expect these areas to be um, probably the ones that are going to get hardened the quickest unless coastal management policies change. The Northeast, um, we have you know, kind of natural rocky shores. Um, and a lot of the area has actually already been developed and already hardened. So we're probably reaching some kind of plateau um, in hardening. But it's these areas that are relatively undeveloped now that we really need to be focused on. Um, so why do we care for hardening the shoreline? Um, it's you know, essentially just a different type of shoreline, right? We're using hard materials. Um, but you know, what does it do in terms of providing functional habitat? Is it equivalent to having a marsh shoreline or just a natural rocky shoreline? Um, is it equivalent in terms of you know, providing fish habitat? So this is a question that, that I really wanted to ask um, in kind of the last year. And so what I did was I did a meta-analysis of all the peer-reviewed studies on shoreline hardening in terms of uh, measuring the biodiversity of those shoreline types, so the number and types of organisms, and the overall abundance of organisms on hardened shorelines and then compared them to natural shorelines. So these are all the studies that have ever um, been published um, globally. So it's not just US studies, but also you know, a lot of work out of Europe and also Australia. And the three types of shorelines I focused on were, were the ones that are most commonly used. So seawalls and bulkheads, these are vertical walls. They're made of concrete, wood, vinyl, depends on where you are. Um, Riprap revetment, so it's some type of rock or concrete piled along the shore. And then these breakwaters that can sometimes include some kind of marsh, but sometimes not. And so I categorized them into these three groups. And then I um, took all of the data from those studies to determine what, what the overall effect was on biodiversity and also just the total number of organisms occupying um, these habitats. And so this is just a table kind of showing the number of studies and the responses by category for biodiversity and abundance. And then this is just to give you a visual of the types of organisms we're talking about. So I had um, five different kind of categories of organisms. So flora or these um, plants, so effects on the actual marsh or seagrass or mangrove habitat. Epibiota or is, or is anything that's growing directly on the shore, so you might have oysters, ribbed mussels, barnacles, tunicates, anything that's actually attaching to the surface. Shorebirds, so any kind of marine or um, shore-based bird, you know, seagulls, plovers, anything dependent on shore habitat. Um, Necton is really uh, mobile fishes and crustaceans, um, so your decapods, your crabs, also any fish that might be using the habitat. And then benthic infauna is a whole suite of organisms actually living in the sediments, so it can be um, you know, bivalves, gastropods, also polychaetes. So I'm going to show you um, a series of graphs here um, on biodiversity and abundance effects. And so all you really need to understand here is that this is a measure of effect size. And the more negative um, on this axis means the larger the negative effect on biodiversity and abundance. So the worse it is for biodiversity and abundance. And this is for seawalls first, riprap, and then breakwaters. And I'm just going to highlight seawalls here because they're, these, this is the group of structures that had a significant negative effect on biodiversity and abundance. So across all of the studies that I was able to compile data from, 
we had a consistent negative effect of this type of structure relative to a natural shoreline on the overall ecosystem biodiversity and abundance. And if this kind of log response ratio is not that intuitive to you, another way to think about it is a difference, a percent difference in the biodiversity and abundance. And so you're essentially talking about a little over a 25% loss in biodiversity um, and also around a 35 to 40% loss in abundance. So this is biodiversity and this is abundance when you have a seawall instead of a natural shoreline like a rocky shoreline or a marsh shoreline. The other two structure types, we did not have a significant effect. They were not different from natural shorelines. But I will say that this is actually likely due to um, there being fewer number of studies. So we didn't have enough studies to really definitively say whether or not they were different or not. Um, and so I'm hoping we'll see more work come out in the coming years. So the story, the jury's still kind of out on these other types of shorelines. So just to give you an idea of who's affected, um, so I mentioned the benthic infauna, um, and I just list a couple of example studies, but it's really you know, polychaetes, amphipods, and also these filter feeding bivalves, clams, um, mussels, that kind of thing that are living in the, in the sediments. Um, shorebirds are negatively affected by seawalls, um, likely because when you have a seawall in place, the beach often goes away in front of that seawall, and these shorebirds depend on that, that shallow um, intertidal zone, that swash zone, to feed on benthic invertebrates. And then nekton, or your fish and crustaceans, are also affected. And these are largely um, organisms that are utilizing uh, salt marsh habitat um, and also seagrass habitat. So when you lose that marsh habitat, you replace it with a, a bulkhead or a seawall, um, you're often losing these marsh residents, like mummy chogs. These are little marsh killifish or um, pinnated shrimp, so shrimp that we like to eat, um, and also blue crabs from the southeast. So organisms that are very dependent on that vegetated structured habitat tend to suffer when you uh, bulkhead a shoreline. But it's not just um, that snapshot biodiversity and abundance that we care about. We're also concerned about the long-term consequences of armoring the shoreline. Um, so typically when you have a, this is a, a typical shoreline for the southeast or maybe for, um, you know, the tidal creeks and the marshes up in New England, you're going to have a shallow sloping tidal marsh, a shallow water refuge, and then maybe some seagrass here, occupied by lots of juvenile fish and crustaceans, shorebirds and whatnot. When you put a bulkhead in place, even though it's permitted to actually be landward of this marsh, we are facing things like sea level rise and also just increased um, you know, severity of storm events. And so over time, you essentially lose that marsh because this bulkhead is not absorbing energy. It's essentially reflecting it back. And so you get a deepening of that intertidal environment through scour of the sediment. Um, and engineers have known this for a long time. They actually typically pile rock in front of bulkheads now to prevent that toe scour. Um, so this is not, not new knowledge. Um, but it's something that's been really hard to document in terms of loss of marsh and, and seagrass and other uh, vegetated habitats, which is why it's actually still permitted um, in the U.S., even though wetlands are federally protected. Um, so this is something that a, a lot of colleagues of mine are, are trying to document now because it happens over decade scales as opposed to just the one or two years that you typically get funding for a, a research project. And so right now I think we have about 10 to 15 years worth of data on a set of shorelines, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to publish something in the near future to kind of document this loss. Um, but the really important part about, about understanding this process is that this is happening below the high water line, which is really typically public trust resources. So these are not, this is, these are areas that are owned by the general public and not by the private property owner um, or developer that's actually put in that structure. So there's a very complicated um, you know, private-public ownership issue here at stake, and that's why the politics and the policies around crystal management can be fairly complicated. So I've kind of told you the bad side, right? I've told you the negative effects of shoreline hardening, but there are alternatives. There are ways that we can protect private property from these coastal hazards um, without compromising the habitats. At least that's what a lot of the NGOs and um, some of NOAA's group has been trying to do in the last couple decades, is develop these types of, of structures, these living shorelines. 
Um, and really, when I came into graduate school, one of the first things I wanted to do was actually test whether or not they were functionally equivalent to a natural or pristine shoreline. So this is a NOAA definition for a living shoreline, but really what you want to take from this is that it has to have some kind of living component. There can be a structural element, an artificial element. You can have rocks out, but you have to have marsh. You have to have mangrove. You have to have some kind of living component to the shoreline for it to be considered, for NOAA and for a lot of the NGOs supporting this, a living shoreline. And here are some examples from North Carolina um, for estuarine shorelines. Um, and I should say for the open coast, beach dune grass would be equivalent um, if you wanted to have an open ocean living shoreline. Um, so this is a marl sill with some marsh behind it. This is a granite sill with marsh on this side. And then this is actually a loose oyster sill that we constructed while I was in graduate school along a really eroded shoreline um, as part of a, an estuarine research reserve. And this, over time, accumulated live oyster and became a, a living oyster reef. So for the work that I was doing in graduate school, um, I really wanted to understand, okay, we have these these sill structures we want to put out, we want to plant marsh, and we want to create a living shoreline, is it really truly equivalent to a natural shoreline? And so this is kind of my schematic of what a natural um, estuarine shoreline would look like in North Carolina. You'd have salt marsh, you'd have intertidal oyster reef, and then you'd have some seagrass. Well, in a lot of places in North Carolina, oysters have been degraded and largely lost, and so a lot of these fringing marshes are eroding because they don't have this natural um, kind of shore protection anymore in the form of oyster reefs. So I decided to compare these shorelines that might, that are currently eroding and might end up being bulkheaded because a private property owner doesn't want their property to erode, and compare them to this newer technique, which is to put a rock sill out in front, and then also compare it to the traditional way, which would have been to put a bulkhead up, and then the thought being you would eventually lose the marsh over time. So I sampled bulkheads where the marsh um, had basically already disappeared a sample of sills with marsh and then marsh alone. And so this first graph is just showing you um, kind of a snapshot of some of the work that I did, but it's a catch per unit effort. So it's basically the number of individuals that we caught. And this first graph is just comparing our control, which is these salt marshes that have lost that intertidal oyster reef, to a marsh with that rock sill out in front. The black bars are the number of fish we caught, and the gray bars are the number of crustaceans that we caught, so blue crabs and shrimp. Um, and what we see here is that we actually see, not only are we um, providing equivalent habitat, we're actually seeing enhancement. So we have a higher abundance, and this also applies in terms of total diversity, of fish and crustaceans occupying these marshes that have sills in front relative to control marshes. And one of the thoughts might be that because these marshes typically had oyster reef in front of them, but that those have been lost through overharvest and erosion, that that rock, it actually colonizes oysters, is serving as a substitute for that natural structure. So this would obviously not be the same in, in other regions that don't have intertidal oysters. You would be thinking about it a little bit differently. But here, it seems to be a substitution in terms of habitat. And in terms of who's present, we have a lot of um, small kind of estuarine, uh, marsh-dependent species like mummy trogs and killifish. But we also start to see some of the commercially and recreationally valuable species. In North Carolina, red drum is extremely recreationally valuable. Blue crab, um, speckled trout, flounder, um, and snapper species, also some pigfish. All of these are species that people are actively fishing for. So it's, it's important for, for not only just for the ecological function, but also for the fisheries, kind of tying back to the original reason we care about coastal ecosystems. Now, for the second part of the study, we decided to go ahead and sample bulkheads as well. So these are bulkheads without any marsh in front, same types of marshes and then marshes with sills. And we did a more targeted sampling to get at these marsh um, dependent organisms. So these killifish, these smaller organisms that seem to really need marsh um, for them to want to be in this habitat. And so what we see is that, again, we see an enhancement, um, although not significant, of fish um, when you add the sill in front of the control marsh, and then a definite significant increase relative to the bulkhead. So the bulkhead has many fewer organisms, um, particularly these marsh-dependent organisms, than the sill or the, the control marsh. 
And so in the control, we tend to see some generalist species that are using these habitats. In the sill, we tend to see some more reef or oyster associated species that are added. So this is starting to kind of get at some explanation as to who is really um, playing or who's really, who's really inhabiting these habitats. But when you get to the bulkhead, you actually only have your generalist species. So you essentially have your marsh residents plus generalists, marsh residents plus reef associated species like sheep's head. <coughs> and then when you have the bulkhead, you go back to generalist species. So this is kind of getting more at the composition of who's really utilizing these habitats. So just to provide some conclusions here, living shorelines, we think so far, um, not based just on the work I've done, but what others have done can serve as better habitat for, for fish and crustaceans than bulkheads. And then at least in North Carolina, where you have intertidal oyster reefs, they're functioning similar to oyster reefs in terms of forage um, and refuge opportunities. So I want to shift gears now and talk about another aspect of um, shorelines. And that's really as whether or not we are creating sustainable and resilient shorelines. So we might find that these living shorelines are ecologically um, better than bulkheads. But if they don't perform in terms of providing erosion protection, no one's actually going to want to implement them. They're going to want to stick with the status quo, which is bulkheads. So while I was in graduate school, Hurricane Irene came through North Carolina. It was in 2011. And it was about in the middle of my graduate career. So I had sampled a lot of sites before the storm, and I was able to go back and sample sites after the storm. And what I did initially was just go along the areas I knew that were hardest hit by the hurricane and survey first just what type of shoreline was there, just you know, driving along in a boat with a GPS and a camera and documenting the type of shoreline there. So these are just regions that I sampled and then the kind. And what I want to point out here is that you have a, a pretty good mix. You have a lot of natural shoreline, but you also have a lot of hardened shoreline here. And it's mostly bulkheads, so this is the bulkhead shoreline. And what I decided to do was that I looked at the engineering literature, because I'm an ecologist, and I was like, how do I really quantify damage to shoreline structures? And I came across a, uh, an engineering um, article that basically said they do a visual classification and they assess whether or not the structure is intact and performing the function that it, that it was intended. And so they had a classification of landward erosion, which is shown here. So the structure is intact but the land that it's supposed to be protecting has eroded away. So that's one category of damage. Um, the structure might be intact, but you have some kind of structural damage. So you have pieces of the structure that are starting to fall away. That's another category of damage that you could assess. Um, you could have a breach. So the structure is still there, but it's actually compromised in some way, and the erosion of the, or erosion of the land is actually occurring behind the structure. And then you can have a complete failure or collapse. And so this is what um, is shown here, where the bulkhead itself has actually fallen into the water and all the land um, has been eroded away. And so what this graph is showing you is that for these different regions, um, how much of the bulkheaded shoreline suffered some kind of damage. And so in these three regions, um, we really had you know, low percentages of damage. But in this one particular area that seemed to be hard to set, 75% of the bulkheads had some kind of damage. And I only show bulkheads here because none of the other types of shoreline exhibited any damage. So the structure that was most commonly implemented for protection was actually the one most readily damaged in a category one hurricane. And that's not even a big hurricane. So that's not Superstorm Sandy. Irene was a blip compared to what we saw in the Northeast. And I love to put up pictures just because I think they really kind of sell um, the story even better. And that's, these are two properties that are roughly 500 feet away from each other. They're on the same shoreline. I've been sampling these properties for years. This property owner, Mr. Acre, has a bulkhead. Um, that's just an arrow to show for reference. Um, Mr. Shawcross had a living shoreline put in. This is a picture I took one year before the storm where we actually planted the marsh grass for him. And this is actually right after the hurricane, so the water level is still pretty high. His bulkhead completely collapsed. He lost, he said, about 22 truckloads of sediment, um, which he then put back in and rebuilt his bulkhead, I think, for about $20,000. <laughs> Even though I walked him down and I showed him that this property actually had no damage except for other people's bulkheads and docks. Washing up. <laughs> so the only damage Jim really suffered was his deck was damaged by pilings, bulkhead material, washing up. 
so no rocks out of place. The shoreline, I mean, the marsh actually looks a lot better. So this is obviously a year later, the plants have grown up, but the water's really only high because it was still high after the storm. I showed Mr. Acree this property and he said that he thought his, he was trying to sell his house. And he said, it's probably gonna catch, um, I'll probably be able to sell it for more if I rebuild a bulkhead because people like bulkheads. So that's, that's what happens. <laughs> Um, and so I showed you those pictures, but I also wanted to make sure, just because sometimes it can be hard to actually quantify damage to a natural shoreline, that we weren't just observing, you know, we weren't, it wasn't just that we weren't able to detect the damage that these shorelines were experiencing. And so I had a series of natural marsh shorelines and shorelines with a sill. So the black is the sill and the open circle are these marsh shorelines that I was able to sample a year before, right after, and then a year after the hurricane. This is the surface elevation of that site. So surface elevation is essentially a proxy for whether or not it's eroding. If the elevation doesn't change, it's not eroding. If it, if it drops, it means it's eroding. We saw no change in those sites through time. And then this is vegetation density. So this is the, the actual number of plants in the marsh. And we did see a drop in the plants. So these, these shorelines were affected by the hurricane. But the neat part is that particularly when you had a sill, those plants rebounded naturally within one year. So this is really getting more to the resilience part of the shoreline, that this property owner, uh, Mr. Shawcross, his, data, his shoreline is part of this data set. He's not having to do anything to his shoreline for it to recover from a storm event. So um, it's not only that they sustain the shoreline better by preventing erosion, but they're also more resilient in terms of rebounding than the bulkheads. And we're continuing some of this work. I have a, a graduate student at UNC that I'm currently working with where, you know, this was one storm event. It could have just been the perfect storm to, to do, for marshes to do well and for bulkheads to do poorly. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we were going to continue these, this work. And she actually went out after Hurricane Arthur in 2014, another Category 1 storm, slightly different in that it came in at a different tide. Um, so the storm surge was different. It was a much faster moving storm. So the impacts were potentially very different. And so she's actually analyzing these data now, but she went back to the same place as I did, did the same assessments. And we're gonna see if we see similar trends with, um, with the second hurricane. And we're combining this with a little bit of social science. So a colleague of mine at Northeastern University, Stephen Cyphers, does a lot of socioeconomic surveys. And so we have a grant where we um, surveyed through online um, and postcard mailings approximately 850 waterfront residents in North Carolina, and we've asked them questions about their perceptions of shoreline hardening in terms of whether they think it's effective or durable by type, you know, whether it's a bulkhead or riprap or living shoreline. And we've also asked them to tell us how much um, damage they've had, what's caused it, and what it costs them in terms of repair and maintenance. And so we're just starting to look at these data now. Um, so I'm just showing you a few graphs from that from uh, the work that Carter's really been leading. These top graphs are the percentage of respondents that report any kind of damage at all or any kind of maintenance cost. And then these are the respondents that if they report damage cost, how much? And if they report maintenance cost, how much? And so what I really want to highlight here is that these natural shorelines, so predominantly marsh shorelines, are lower in terms of just whether they report damage at all or maintenance at all. So there's a lot of people who are reporting no damage or maintenance the entire lifetime of their shoreline. And then even if they are reporting damage or maintenance costs, they're significantly lower than these bulkhead shorelines, which are most common. Um, riprap is the other shoreline that we're really not sure. We think riprap tends to be more resilient than bulkheading just because it's rock kind of piled on shore. And so it's not suffering from the same kind of structural failure. Um, but um, we're still kind of exploring because many, many fewer people have riprap shorelines in North Carolina than bulkhead shorelines. So just, I kind of want to finish with kind of a thought about what it would really take to get people to shift to living shorelines. So we've shown you the ecology, we've showed you a little bit of the engineering, we've also showed you a little bit of the cost, but people are still, you know, they're resistant to change. Um, they, they like the status quo, they like what they've known for decades, bulkheads have you know, been something we've used for, for a long time along our coastlines. And so this is work by my colleague Steven where he's surveyed people and asked them, you know, would they be willing to try a living shoreline? And initially he just surveyed them and asked them that simple question. And in Alabama, 
No way. They want a bulkhead. But then he asked them, well, what if we had some kind of cost share? And he varied the amount of money that was cost shared. So the state would maybe give you a tax credit, for instance. And the remarkable part is that people were really much more likely to consider it. 40% of the people changed their mind a little bit and said, yeah, maybe I'd be a little unsure, or maybe I'd be even likely to build a living shoreline if all of the cost wasn't on me. Um, we did have roughly 6% of Alabama respondents who actually went in the other direction, and that's because they were people who commented and believed that they didn't want the government spending taxpayer dollars um, on any kind of private property. So that's the, that 6% that you see there. Um, and so this is just a picture of a conversion of a bulkhead to a living shoreline where they've actually not removed this bulkhead. They've essentially filled in on top of it and planted marsh. So this is something they're trying um, with NGOs and with cost incentives in some areas. And we're starting to see some, some progress there. So um, that's kind of the positive note I want to end on, um, is that living shorelines are a viable option um, in some places. It's not going to work everywhere. And with the right amount of education and incentives, it's possible we could push private property owners in the direction of thinking about the long-term sustainability and resilience and, and ecological function of their shorelines, rather than just, I want my property to stay exactly the way it is for the next 30 years. Um, so with that, I just want to thank all of my collaborators, my co-authors, funding sources over my graduate work and my postdoc work. And if you have more questions, um, Stephen has developed this shoreline site where you can actually post your own personal experiences if you're a private homeowner um, to this site um, with your shoreline. Um, you can even contact us and we can send you a camera if you're um, willing to take pictures during storm events. And then we have um, some lab pages and Twitter account if you want to get in touch with me. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. That was uh, bursting with questions, but I have to stick to my own self-imposed well, format. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to wait for so. Um, so uh, as I said, we'll have the two talks and then um, uh, a question and answer session and uh, then a short break. Um, so uh, our next speaker is Anna Shurovich. Shro 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 Anna Shurovich. <laughs> Sorry. Um, She's um, a researcher in um, the uh, Marine Bioacoustics Lab at Scripps, um, and in particular focusing on uh, marine bioacoustics, um, and in particular of uh, exploited marine mammals, which I take to mean whales and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I don't know why, but I have to come up with some anecdote for each talk, or at least something that fascinated me. And I, I guess my, my, although I knew that whales talk to each other, and I grew up hearing about songs of humpback whales, I only recently heard an anecdote, which I really have to track down, I have to try this, that evidently um, Inuit, um, a group of Inuit in um, what used to be the Northwest Territories, which I now I guess is now the Netsalik Territory in Canada, um, uh, they would hunt whales. The way they would find whales is to take a paddle, their kayak paddle, and put it in the water, put their ear next to the, the paddle blade, and they could actually hear when the whales were close by. And that would be how they would know that they were close and they could actually go on the hunt. So apparently, Bioacoustics has been known to humans for, for years and years, uh, but is now being used um, to understand them. And unfortunately, uh, one of the byproducts of uh, humans is to pollute just about everything uh, we can get our hands on. Uh, so we have light pollution in the sky, and we have noise pollution in the oceans. So anyway, Anna. So thank you for the introduction. And um, my, my career as a bioacoustician, I've, I've been spanning the fields of biology and engineering pretty much this whole time. And so um, I, I do much less well with jokes. So I promise that my title is the only pun I'm going to try on you. But I do <laughs> promise to play you a lot of sounds, because I think that's the, the really cool part and the really uh, fascinating part about all of this. But what I will tell you about today is two kind of stories, two different examples of how 
I, with my colleagues, have been using sounds that animals make to learn more about endangered marine species. And I'll have an example from about blue whales and another example on grouper and fish uh, to see how we can learn more about the populations and, and use it for better uh, management approaches. So ocean is, in fact, a very noisy place. Uh, partly because sound in ocean travels really well. It travels much further than light does. So a lot of animals use it then to communicate because it's a lot harder to see things in the ocean than it is to hear things. And among, um, among sources of sound, it's not just the animals that are making sounds. Just about anything in and around the ocean makes sounds. So first of all, there's lots of natural sources of sound in the ocean. Things like rain, waves, or even earthquakes. They are, let's see if I can play this for you. Uh, they are kind of intermittent sources of sound. So it sounds like thunder, but it's really a sound of an earthquake underwater recorded uh, by hydrophones. And a lot of these uh, natural sources, or what I call them, are very low frequency, kind of low pitch, kind of like you heard that sound. In addition to these sound sources, lots of animals make sounds, not just whales, which are probably the ones you're most familiar with, but also fish and invertebrates also make a lot of sounds. So just a couple of examples I want to play for you. I'm not going to play humpback whale songs because everybody has heard those. But here, one example, this is a sperm whale clicking. Sperm whales use these clicks for echolocation, similar to what bats are doing. Um, but then, rather than playing you a humpback song, I want to play you a minke whale song. And this is a, a minke whale that you would hear it if you went offshore here in the Atlantic somewhere and stuck your head in the ocean. Because you can, in fact, if you're even swimming around or diving, you can hear it. These animals are so loud that you can often hear them if they're in the vicinity. A couple of unique things about this minky whale song is that it actually, you'll notice, it's very long. They'll just it'll go on for a while. And I'm just playing this at regular speed as it was recorded in the ocean. So this is literally what you would hear if you go out there and just were in the vicinity of one. And so this repetitive nature is also one of the features that we see commonly, particularly for baleen whales where they're just making sounds over and over and over again. Um, but another interesting part, speeding up a little bit, sometimes they slow down, sometimes they speed up, sometimes they keep it constant. We don't really know why. But so, as I said, this is what minke whales here in the Atlantic sound like. If you went into the Pacific, they sound totally different there. And I'll get, and this is also a common thing I'll get to in a minute, but I just wanted to entice you with that piece of information here. Um, but then of course, Another important source of sound is us humans. Um, shipping is a huge contributor to low frequency noise. So you can hear the propellers of, of boats. And so again, this is a type of sound because they're typically low frequency. They will travel over long distances and can contribute to increased noise levels along uh, across large areas. But there's other also anthropogenic sources, such as oil and gas exploration, that are large contributors of uh, ocean noise pollution, as are even things like echo sounders. When you're going out fishing and your uh, little fish finder is on, that's loud and noisy, uh, navy sonar, etc. So to listen to all these kinds of sounds, we use a variety of underwater recording devices. And since I'm mostly interested in long-term trends and changes over a long time, uh, what I've mostly been using are autonomous recorders that you can deploy on the ocean floor for extended periods of time. And they just record all the sounds over a certain bandwidth, over a certain uh, frequency range. And all of these devices, they have same features, they're fundamentally the same things. They consist of a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone. They have a data logging system of some sort hard disk to store the data. We have to retrieve the instruments typically to get our data back and download them. Um, and batteries. And so those two factors, the batteries and the um, hard disk space are going to limit to how long you can actually deploy them on the ocean floor. On the left hand side, I'm showing you this is an instrument that we build in-house at Scripps. And it's a 
Typically, it's a fairly large uh, device. That it's called a high-frequency acoustic recording package. And we can deploy these instruments for up to a year, recording at very large bandwidth, leave them in deep water. And when we re uh, retrieve them, get uh, information on a plethora of anthropogenic sounds and, and animal sounds and, and any other kind of uh, geographic or physical sounds as well. On the right-hand side, I'm showing you an example of a recorder that's actually an off-the-shelf uh, recorder you can just buy. It's actually a company here in Massachusetts that makes them. And we've been using this for some of the shallow water, shorter deployments. This is actually from the grouper work that I'll be talking about. So there's a variety of possibilities and, and kind of scales in which these instruments come. But again, the idea is to get long-term records of, of sounds from underwater. And once we have these records, we can learn a lot about the actual animals that are making those sounds. We can learn more, a lot about their distribution, uh, also population structure or trends because most of the animals have species-specific calls. Sometimes they're even area-specific. Uh, we can learn about behavior because they produce different calls depending on their behavioral state. If they're hungry or if they are looking for a mate, just like humans, they're going to say different things. And then ultimately we want to apply this to species management or to also understand how us humans are impacting the animals. So. Good introduction. Let me start with the first case study. I want to talk about blue whales for a minute. And blue whales, I don't know if any of you have ever had the fortune of seeing a blue whale, but they're awesome animals. They're the largest animal that has ever lived. They're bigger than any dinosaur. They can be up to 30 meters long and weigh, or 100 feet if you prefer that system, and they weigh over, or it can weigh up to 200 tons. It's a massive, massive thing. And um, we find them across all of the world's oceans. They're migratory animals like most of the other baleen whales. They spend uh, winters in kind of lower latitude, warmer waters, mating and breeding, and they travel to higher latitude regions that are more productive, and they feed there during the summer. Um, currently, we divide, or we, we, we know that there's at least three subspecies of blue whales. The Antarctic blue whale is the largest of them. This is the one that's up to 1,000 or 100 feet long and 30 meters long. Um, they're, they're found around the Antarctic continent. They were the primary target of the whaling industry in the earliest 20th century because they have a lot of blubber, which meant a lot of oil that the whaling industry was after. The second subspecies are the pygmy blue whales. They're really pygmy little things. They only are about 24 meters long. <laughs> Uh, still quite substantial in weight as well because they tend to be shorter and stockier. They have shorter tail and uh, longer heads, so uh, still provide a lot of oil. Um, they're found primarily, or the, they're initially found in the Indian Ocean, so we constrain that subspecies to that geographic region. And uh, then finally, all of the other blue whales in other oceans, we just put them all in the same subspecies of just your general blue whale. Now, the reason why I study blue whales uh, is that they actually are very vocal. They produce songs that are quite distinct. Uh, they're very low frequency, kind of low pitched songs, and they are very loud. They can travel over very long distances. And uh, about 10 years ago, Mark McDonald and colleagues offered this uh, hypothesis that the different songs that blue whales sing in different populations might actually indicate separate populations. Rather than having these three subspecies, we might think of it in a little bit finer scales. Because we know that even though I said that they're found in all the world's oceans, they are really these distinct populations in places where we do and we don't see blue whales. And so this map shows uh, that information that based on these different songs of blue whales, uh, where we know and see them occurring. And so for example, off the coast of uh, California, Washington, and Oregon, there's one population that moves from Central America up to Southern California and up to Gulf of Alaska seasonally. There's also another population that's more kind of in the Central and Western Pacific. There's a population of blue whales offshore here as well. But then in the Southern Hemisphere, we have a couple of different populations in Southern Indian Ocean and one in the Northern Indian. And then this is this Antarctic blue whale that is uh, the largest of them all down uh, circumpolarly around Antarctica. And so, let me play for you a couple of their songs because I want to demonstrate to you how they're actually very different. So you'll be able to hear them. Now, actually to hear them, I had to speed them up. Like I said, they're very, very low pitch. They're below our hearing. But I've sped all of these songs four times, which means that they are four times higher frequency. So that's the first part. 
and uh, four times shorter duration. So they're really faster than they would be usually. Um, so there's the gap. So this up here is a spectrogram. That's a way that we represent kind of visually sounds. And it's time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. So that first pulsing bit is this right here. And then that tone is the second part. So that is our Northeast Pacific blue whale. Just for comparison, let me play to you the blue whales as they sound off of Australia. And again, these are sped up four times like the previous ones. You can hear there's a different pattern to them. for you the Antarctic blue whale calls. And so here, it's harder to see them here, but these little blips down here, they're uh, Antarctic blue whale calls. You'll notice they look a lot less complex than some of these other ones, and they're also much lower frequency. So you will have a really hard time hearing these, even though, again, they're sped up four times. So it's much simpler and uh, quite a bit lower. So like I said, these songs, uh, as far as we know, we believe that they're produced primarily or exclusively by males. We know that it's true for the blue whales off northeast in the Northeast Pacific. So we're assuming they have some sort of a mating function. But the details are that are still a little bit uh, unsure. Now that I've introduced you to the whale songs, I want to tell you a little bit about the whaling and the management of whales kind of worldwide. Um, because it's, I think it's a very interesting and, and informative story. Um, so the International Whaling Commission is the international organization that was founded in 1946 when the whale populations worldwide were in heavy declines with the goal of managing the whaling so that they can continue whaling for a long time. And as uh, their system of management, they had a quota system where each country, each whaling country, was assigned a certain number of blue whale units. Now, blue whale unit is a very interesting measure because it's, it's a measure of how much oil you get from the whale. And so one blue whale unit was one blue whale. It was also, or it was a two fin whales, two and a half humpbacks, or six say whales. So each country would get a certain number of blue whale units, and then they could catch it in any kind of combination of all these different species. And so what that contributed to was quite a um, rapid kind of succession, success, uh, successive depletion of all the different species because the whalers could just keep going out and, and collecting whatever they found. But if ever, as the blue whales were becoming more and more rare, whenever they found one, they would still catch it because it was quite valuable to catch them. Until finally, in 1966, their numbers have dropped so much that they became protected worldwide. It took another 20 years for a global whaling moratorium to come into place because all of the populations kept decreasing. And since then, the IWC has been tasked not just with management of whaling, but also has expanded its mission to conservation of uh, whales themselves. So currently, uh, one of the major things that they are interested in and working on is stock assessment uh, as a part of understanding of how the populations are recovering post whaling. But then also to be able to, to do this kind of stock assessment, we really need to know a lot more about the population structure of animals. So over the years, they, they go through different species and different uh, stocks and try to understand it and use the available scientific information to delineate and then kind of get a better sense of how to properly uh, assess these uh, stocks and populations. And so the current focus uh, are the pygmy blue whales, so these smaller, chubbier um, southern hemisphere animals. And just uh, last week, I was actually at the meeting of the scientific committee of the International Whaling Commission, where a, a, a large variety of scientists were brought in to provide information, all, all kind of best known available science, on genetics and acoustics of these two species to try to help form a picture of how these populations look. So what I'm showing you here, the, the map on the bottom, this is the map of all the locations where genetic samples, so basically tissues of blue whales, 
are available um, to do genetic analysis to compare genetic difference between the uh, pygmy blue whales. And so there's a lot of data that were collected off of Chile. In the Indian Ocean, there's some off Madagascar, South Africa, a little bit here off India. But most samples really come from uh, waters off Australia. And when doing uh, metadata analysis, the uh, geneticists found that the populations in the Indian Ocean and off Chile are actually as different from each other as this pygmy blue whale that I told you, the subspecies that exists that is from the Indian Ocean, is from the Antarctic subspecies. So there is genetic evidence to, sh to say that the Chilean population should be its own subspecies. But then we also looked at acoustics and how do the different acoustic stocks map into this genetic variability. And what we find, so again, this is now a map uh, of all of the places where different blue whale songs were recorded in the Southern Hemisphere. And different symbols are different song types. Um, and you'll see that there's actually a lot more data that we have than, than they've had in the genetic data. And uh, what we have found is that, so this is an update of the work that McDonald and colleagues did before. Uh, and we have found that in a lot of these places, their initial maps and hypotheses were actually pretty good in terms of where the animals occur and that sing these particular songs. But then interestingly, here in off Chile, we do have two different song types that occur at the same times and places at all times, and they match that genetic population that's distinct from the Indian Ocean. But based on our data in the Indian Ocean, we have at least three different populations, acoustic populations, if you will, for now. So there is the turquoise diamonds, the red triangles, and the red triangles is that an uh, Australian song, and then the yellow uh, crosses. There's also this little other diamond up here, but that is a new song type that hasn't quite been confirmed if it's blue whale or not, but likely is. And what you can see when you map the places and times when these different songs occur is that Eastern and Western Indian Ocean songs are distinct and occur at different places. Northern, difference, Northern Indian song is also different from them, and it's also spatially separated. And there's this area in the Central Indian Ocean where there's some overlap between the songs, but northern Indian Ocean song is never there at the same time when the southern songs are there. And so what the geneticists have said seeing this information is, well, okay, we really don't have very much data here from the western Indian Ocean. But based on this information so far, we have reason to think that the population off of Australia and off of Madagascar could be different. So one of the outcomes of the meeting is for recommendation that was put forward that there should be more data collected, genetic data collected in western uh, Indian Ocean so that the comparison of genetics can be done between these two populations to see if and how different they actually are. At the same time, it was also useful for, for the uh, acoustics people in the crowd um, to, to talk to geneticists because what we found, so in, from genetic data also, they found that the animals off of Australia and New Zealand, uh, in the small samples that they currently have, there aren't genetic differences necessarily that are, that are obvious. And when you talk to geneticists, they'll give you different answers to how strongly they believe that it indicates that those are really indeed same populations or, or same um, substocks. But uh, geneticists have actually really good ways of looking qual uh, quantitatively at difference between the DNA of, of animals. And what we have done so far as a community, as acoustics community, is look at more of the differences in song in a qualitative way to delineate these different things. So by working with geneticists, there's hope that we can develop a more quantitative tools to compare how different these songs actually are. Because if you remember when I played you these songs, a couple of them were very similar. And some of these songs here in the southern hemisphere, they're quite similar to each other, but they're very different from the Antarctic song. And they're very different from some of the Northern Hemisphere songs. So if we can measure the amount of difference in songs of different uh, populations, we could also form more refined hypotheses on how likely they are to actually be different subpopulations. So that's kind of a, a large scale story. On a, on a finer scale story, um, by looking at some of the song variability in the North Pacific, we have found that even one song that we thought was the same, maybe not quite true. So here I'm showing you, uh, this is the first song that I played you, the tonal part of it, in Southern California and Gulf of Alaska that we record regularly. And by visual inspection, if you've seen enough of these at least, 
uh, it becomes apparent that there is this little kink here in the Gulf of Alaska song where the frequency kind of steps down a bit. And so when uh, we looked at this in a little bit more detail, we found that in fact, so this is now from many measured calls in Gulf of Alaska and Southern California over a couple of different years, we find that in fact this step in Gulf of Alaska is much more prominent than it is in Southern California. But the question is, is that really important and how does it matter to the whales? Now, we don't quite know that yet, but what we do see is in addition to this step, now I've put this on the same y-axis here, and you'll notice that this call is much higher frequency than that call. It's about one and a half hertz difference, which may seem trivial. However, we know that blue whales actually slowly over time are decreasing their frequency. Their calls are getting lower and lower pitched. And the difference between these two call types is about eight years of frequency shift. So that makes me think that these guys are actually separate and they don't, they're not necessarily communicating with each other, at least uh, in the same way. So I think we're, we've made some good progress in, in using these large scale uh, distinctions in song to, to get some idea of population variability, but we're really getting to the point where we can think of some finer scale differences and how much uh, difference in population that may imply. Um, also, this, this particular the last detail that I told you about the Northeast Pacific song difference is, is interesting or irrelevant because we have known that the blue whale population of California has been stable for the last 20 years or so, which is not quite what people expect because they're supposed to be increasing and recovering from whaling. And one of the ongoing questions is why are they not? And it's possible that they're expanding their range, which it's kind of the, the going hypothesis as that they're just moving to different areas. But these differences in songs may indicate that that's not entirely the whole story, that there might be something else going on there. These maybe are somehow different populations. So the next challenge for us is going to be uh, to figure out how to use these acoustics to actually do abundance estimates. This is one thing that's really important for the managers, both uh, from the Navy perspective, but also in the International Whaling Commission community to, to be able to enhance uh, the application of these data further. So next, I'm going to shift gears all together and I want to talk about another uh, group of animals that is just as commercially important and I would argue maybe close to being as charismatic, uh, which are groupers. <laughs> they are really charismatic. Um, NASA grouper, for example, they're famous for being very friendly. Divers love them because if you go on a reef, they'll come up to you. They're this huge fish. It's an impressive experience if you ever have it. It's as impressive as it is to see a blue whale in the ocean. It's just as impressive to have a giant fish come up to your face and say hello. Uh, they're about five, they can be five, six feet long. They're, they can be pretty big fish. Um, and so they're, they're ecologically important on reefs because they're voracious predators they uh, are kind of the top-down control to, to the reefs. They're commercially important because they are very tasty. And they also have this recreational value because people like seeing them on the reefs and like swimming with them. Uh, there's a number of other species of groupers that are common uh, found through the Atlantic and in, in the reefs of the Atlantic. But m many of these group groupers, they have this unfortunate spawning behavior where fish from all around will come and aggregate in one place at a very predictable time Every year, same place, same time to spawn. They'll make these aggregations of thousands of fish, which then make them very susceptible to overfishing. Because if you're a fisherman, you know the fish are there, you drop your hook in line, and you can decimate that population in a matter of days. Now, luckily for me, these guys make also lots of sounds. So let me show you what they sound like. So that was the red hind grouper. They're very common in this site um, in the Caymans where we've been working. This is a NASA grouper. They're a little bit grumpier. Um, so what we have been doing in the last couple of years is working on a little Cayman where uh, this is actually a very special place where a new, well, new to humans aggregation, spawning aggregation was discovered in early 2000s. So the Caymans are, uh, a three island chain in the middle of the Caribbean, just south of Cuba. And Little Cayman is the smallest of them. 
And here on the west side, in early 2000s, the fishermen discovered a previously unknown spawning aggregation. They started fishing it hard, the numbers plummeted. The Canadian government, however, stepped in, stopped fishing, and started uh, encouraging research in this uh, location to learn more about how we can protect these uh, animals so that we can have sustainable fishery and keep them under reefs. And uh, in the time since, in the last 10 or 12 years, the Grouper Moon Project has been composed of a variety of scientists who have gone out and done numerous dives on and around the spawning site to study more or understand better the spawning biology, uh, the interchange of different populations and things like that. We joined them uh, a year and a half ago and put recorders down because prior to us joining, the, so this, the grouper spawn at dusk and the divers would go down, observe spawning events, but then it would get dark. So they didn't really know how much longer, that is the spawning just happened during that time? What did the fish do afterwards? Did they disperse? Are they still in the same spot on the reef? Kind of the, the dynamics of the movements were uh, highly unknown. So we put a number of recorders at the site, had all kinds of uh, misfortunes and adventures uh, in doing so, but we've had some really exciting data and, and really uh, interesting things. And this is mostly work that uh, my student Casey has been um, pushing through on. And so one of the approaches that we took is using what's called soundscape analysis, which is kind of this large scale of looking at the whole spectrum of, of sounds and trying to divide it up into different bands that are of, of interest. And so what she has done, you can see here again, these are spectrograms of different grouper sounds in the top panel. And you can see there's a lot of energy in most of these calls up in a few hundred hertz range. Once you get lower, even though there's a lot of call activity there as well, there's a lot of anthropogenic sound. So she was looking for a fine balance between the two. And then at higher frequency, we get a lots of other fish sounds, a lot of them actually squirrel fish, which are quite abundant on the reef. And so what she has done is gone through and measured five minute and one hour averages of sound levels for these two frequency bands over the times of our, our whole deployments. And first what we've looked at is how do the fish daily soundscape change during the first uh, period that we had recorders out in 2015. So just as a cue, I'm using a little picture of Nassau as the Saranid, as the uh, grouper band uh, descriptor. And then this is our little uh, soldier uh, squirrel fish that is representing other fish. And so on these plots, this is uh, about six days of data. The gray shaded boxes represent nighttime. And what you can see, there is the blue is the five minute averages and the, uh, the black is the one hour averages. So you see there's a lot of variability from five minute to five minute interval. But when you sum over that, there is a bit of a nocturnal peak just as a, a, about sunset. Um, but I should also point out that during this year at this particular site, NASA group responding occurred on these two nights. And then back here in these last three nights is a, was tiger group responding period. And you can see that during the tiger spawning group in particular, um, there is a little bit stronger signals because we actually had more tiger group on our particular site this year. But you, can, you see some of these daily patterns. Same is true for the squirrel fish, but they have a very clear crepuscular pattern with peaks at dusk and, and dawn and relatively lower levels during the day. Now, in addition to the daily cycle in calls, there's also changes in the lunar um, in the vocal activity with lunar phase. Spawning often happens, or generally happens, sometime around, usually a few days after a uh, uh, new moon. And so here I'm showing six days at a period in between the moon phases. Uh, this plot is the new moon, and this plot shows the full moon time period. And what I just want you to take home from this is that the average level, so basically average noise, this band of, of grouper sounds is substantially higher, two to three dB. Well, it doesn't sound much. Uh, it's a, this is a logarithmic scale. So it's actually uh, quite a substantial increase during the new and, and full moon. So the animals are a lot more active during, during those uh, other times. We found the same pattern for the uh, squirrel fish as well. But then what we really want to know is, well, do these metrics actually represent fish? Can we certainly say that these are, these are fish that we are calling or detecting? And so what Casey has done is gone through and logged painfully all of the calls that have occurred over those seven, six days. 
And that was about 20,000 calls that uh, she's gone through. Not just, they're basically identified by species. A lot of them are red hinds, but we have a, quite a variety of, of animals in there. And the blue line here in both of these plots shows the number of calls at uh, any given hour. And then the black is still the soundscape metric. And you'll notice, so uh, when doing cross cor correlations in these, you see that it's, uh, it's an okay uh, relationship between the two. So there is some indication that they're, they're good proxies, these metrics um, that you can compute rapidly are good proxies. Specifically, here during the time when we had peak tiger spawning period, you can see that these uh, increases in, in number of calls match quite nicely with the increases in our acoustic level. So we're definitely doing a good job measuring tiger grouper presence. Um, but so in addition, when we had all these calls, what I didn't mention right away is that we didn't just have one recorder out there, we had multiple recorders. We had uh, up to four to five recorders um, simultaneously collecting this data in a, an array that was about 50 meter by 50 meter um, a large. And so what you can do when you have that kind of a, a setup is if you hear the same sound of multiple instruments, you can use the time in the, the difference in the time of the arrival of that same signal to multiple locations to localize where the sound is actually coming from. And so the process then consists basically of finding the sound of interest, doing some acoustic processing where you filter it, you rectify the signal, and then you do cross correlation between the two pairs of instruments and you look for the time delay in the peak of that cross correlation and that gives you the time delay. And you will notice here, this is time in seconds. So our peak is just slightly off or offset from zero. So this is a small array. We're looking at very, very small uh, time differences because we're localizing on a very small time scale. But what, what you get, once you have this time delay with any two uh, instruments, what that gives you is this hyperbolic solution. So it's a hyperbola along which that sound may have occurred. And then if you have multiple pairs, you get multiple hyperbole and where they cross, that is where your sound is occurring. So what Casey's in the process of doing then is overlaying the locations of all these different sounds that we can localize on a map that was collected of um, habitat quality. So what I'm showing here, the black uh, triangles are the instrument recorder locations and then the circles of different colors are calls of different species. There's different call types for different species. So all the blue ones are the Nassau and tiger calls. The red, there's a couple of them are the red hind. There's also some black grouper and some that we haven't identified the species yet. And so you see there's quite a, a few calls that have occurred here. And then underneath it, this is the, the bottom, the reef. And the lighter areas are sandy patches. And then these darker parts are coral or other uh, hard structure. So what we're in the process now, just kind of qualitatively looking at this, it appears that these uh, intersections or kind of border lines between sand and uh, rough uh, reef structure may be really important habitats. But we're in the process of actually quantifying those uh, call localizations and, and seeing what kind of habitat different calling occurs on. So to sum up, I hope I've convinced you that acoustics can be a really powerful tool to help us uh, learn more about the biology, distribution, ecology of a variety of marine animals. In particular though, what we are finding is it's going to be very important to understand the context of these different calls to really go further in um, bringing that context into management perspective, understanding better where and when and why the different animals are occurring. And then I think what's going to be important also is to continue. There's been a lot of advances on the hardware side uh, and um, kind of, yeah, hardware side of things. But I think the future advances are really coming in our ability to process this data and interpret this data. And I think using qualitative tools and combining techniques from different fields is going to be crucial to that. So I think that's the next exciting thing. So with that, I want to acknowledge the funding agencies and our, all the collaborators and students, and I thank you for your attention. So, um, if we can get the computer sit up here, and we can take questions from the audience. And if you don't have them, I have some questions myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah.
Oh, yeah, yeah, you should uh, take the microphone. Yeah. I, I have uh, a question for each speaker. Is that okay? Yeah. So first, uh, Rachel, I was just wondering in, uh, you know, advocating and planning for transitioning from hard uh, shoreline protection to living coastline, how are you factoring in the anticipated uh, rise in ocean level? Yeah, so um, it'll depend on where where you're considering doing living shorelines versus hard shorelines. And and I will say first, like I, I think we'll we'll have a hybrid approach everywhere. So places like New York City or Miami, where you have a lot of hard infrastructure, you're gonna need some engineering structures like floodgates. You're gonna need seawalls in some places. And the idea is to, to kind of integrate the living components in with the hard infrastructure for these really heavily urbanized areas that are going to see a lot of sea level rise like Miami. Um, in some areas where we expect, you know, in the next hundred years there to be enough for the area to be underwater, we're essentially trying to, to plan for that retreat in the sense that a lot of these living shoreline designs put the, the hard structure seaward of the habitat they're trying to protect so that as, sea, as the sea level rises, those habitats, those marshes, could actually migrate landward without having a, a hard structure behind them. So that's one way that the living shoreline approach, particularly with the offshore kind of protection, is factoring in, in sea level, is that assuming that those habitats can migrate like they would if you didn't have any development. Um, but again, that's also assuming that the rates of sea level um, don't you know, increase too rapidly. Yeah, right, so we, right. we still have, there's a lot of new research right now on um, using dredge material to actually um, deposit sediment onto marshes like in the Gulf Coast that are sediment starved and are actually sinking as sea level is rising to help them keep up and be able to migrate. So I think we're going to need a lot of different, um, both engineering and ecological techniques, and it's going to be very region specific. So yeah, it's complicated. So the other question I had, it's a question I've always had and I never had a chance to ask it before, which is what exactly is it about sonar that makes it deleterious to whales and other sea life? How specifically, physiologically, does it impact the whale? So there's several different types of sonar. Um, there's the low frequency sonar that can be anywhere, it's really usually below a kilohertz. And the mid frequency active sonar is the one that's been most uh, implicated recently in the last 16, 20 years in um, stranding events for adonises, but really a variety of species. And it's an interesting question because the, the frequencies at which those sonars are occurring are not necessarily the same frequencies at which the animals are producing sound and therefore it would be reasonable to assume that their hearing is most sensitive. Um, but in the cases where it, we have seen uh, impact is basically in animals that have stranded and they've had uh, various uh, internal damage in, in air cavities and, and structures of that nature. So there is presumably some resonance in, in, in um, air cavities and, and soft tissues resulting from the sonar. But I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, it's a lot more complicated, I think, than just a direct physio physiological impact often, because there is, um, we certainly know there's a variety of um, bathymetric and, and other constraints that lead to some of these events leading to strandings and others that don't. So, um, it's a, I guess, it, yeah, it's a, it's a complex answer. I'm not sure that I answered your question satisfactorily, but. So these changes you see in the dead whales at a beach, uh, they're not artifacts of the, I guess, the dying experience itself, the certain or something. Like the what? I'm missing. The dying experience, you know, they, 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 they die on the beach. Right, but so some, sometimes, those, often they'll, they'll strand or they come on the beach because they're disoriented or otherwise right. under stress, and um, are trying to escape whatever, move away from whatever source is causing them the stress. So they may die from the internal injuries, but that's not always the case. Sometimes they'll just die from the process of stranding where they don't want to be in the environment that is causing them stress. Question in the back. Yeah. 
Yes, Dr. Gitman. Um, this is a question about denial, about sea level rise. Uh, and um, I wonder what the scientific community is going to do about this. I can hear all of the Band-Aid uh, approaches to dealing with this, but my sense is that scientists are trying to be as conservative and cautious as they can be about the sea level rise, but it's rising. So you have at least from the Carolinas north, uh, just affecting the, the east coast, um, what will be a disaster down the line, and Band-Aids aren't going to fix it. And I, a couple of things there that the, I believe it was the North Carolina government that is <laughs> yeah. in a state of denial from hell, to put it gently, uh, much like climate change denial. So they wouldn't allow, what was it, a law or regulation to go through, and I'm sure they're one of many. I think of Miami, you know, all, all the time like this, but I can see where this is going to be a real problem. What's your take on that, if you want to make it public? But my real question is, what is the science community going to do? Because they've got to educate people. Um, well, yeah, it, it is a very complicated issue. Um, we are in a very polarized political society right now. Um, and I think it's gotten even more polarized even since I started graduate school. Um, when, I, when I started in North Carolina, it was pre the um, passing of the ban on sea level rise. Um, and I was actually working with the Coastal Resources Commission and with the Division of Coastal Management, and they were fairly proactive. They had a science panel that had developed different trajectories for sea level rise, and they were basing their new coastal management policies on these different trajectories. And North Carolina in the 70s was actually very progressive, and they banned all shoreline hardening on open coasts. So if you go to North Carolina, you don't see seawalls on any of the beaches. Um, you'll see an occasional jetty or groin that the Army Corps built in maybe the 40s or 50s at major inlets, but you don't have hardening like you see in other parts of the country. And then when I was in graduate school, we had a change in the political um, arena, and they essentially turned over the entire Department of Natural Resources. They dismantled the science panel, and then they passed a law largely driven by developers um, who wanted to be able to develop in high-risk areas um, because it would, in the short term, make them a lot of money. They said, we don't want you to make any new law about coastal management based on any projection on future sea level rise. It has to be based on historic rates of sea level rise, which no climate scientist would agree is in any way reasonable um, because the idea is that it's sea level rise is accelerating. Um, but that was the law they passed. And so... Um, they since have overturned our ban on shoreline hardening and are now allowing terminal groins, um, which are basically put in place where you have developers wanting to build in extremely dynamic, unstable inlet areas. And they want to have these groins put in place to protect their high-risk, high-dollar developments. So yeah, North Carolina has gone kind of backwards since I um, have lived there. Um, but the scientific community is basically trying to do a multifaceted approach. So we obviously, in a lot of areas, are saying retreat is going to be the only option in the long term. I mean, you're going to have to move away. And we're a disaster-driven society, so it will likely take events like Sandy, like Katrina, where whole communities are going to get wiped out, and then we're going to choose to not rebuild. Um, and that's a very sad way of looking at it, but I, I think it's the most likely scenario because everything we've seen in terms of coastal management changes has been reactionary. Um, we are seeing more funding post-Sandy, I think, for resilience efforts. Some of the major cities like New York, Miami, are starting to think about ways they can, they can plan for the future. So New York has adopted like a long-term plan for how they're going to deal with sea level rise that includes gray and green infrastructure. Um, there's a design in place right now that will actually let part of the downtown area flood naturally and then just recede by including kind of you know vegetation and a series of flood gates and you know it'll be it'll be a, co a combined effort of engineering and ecology. Um, so I think we just try to, to advocate for many different solutions at many different phases of this process. Um, I think if you just preach retreat, 
you will only reach a small portion of the population. So the, the surveys I showed in the talk were set at 850 responses. We asked the question, how, is, you know, how much do you think sea level is going to rise? And how do you think it will affect your property? And what are you going to do? And most people said, um, I mean, the range in sea level went from you know, zero to 100 feet. I mean, people, people have no idea how much sea level is going to rise. And, and so that's one issue is the education component. Two, even if they said it was going to rise, I got responses of mostly, well, it's not going to affect me, it's going to affect the next generation. Because a lot of people that live on the waterfront in North Carolina are retirees. You know, this is where they've retired for, you know, and they're like, well, you know, my grandkids will deal with it. Um, and then the third part of what are they going to do about it, overwhelmingly most people said nothing. So, and most people said they were willing to pay over 100% increase in their insurance, even with sea level rise. So, so they're not willing to move either. They're going to pay the insurance. Um, and so one change we may see is that the insurance companies are starting to pull out. So in the Outer Banks in North Carolina, um, they won't insure whole stretches of shoreline now. You can't rebuild based on insurance anymore. You have to be willing to build your house with no insurance. People still do it, but um, it's, it's at least moving in that direction. So people, people respond to monetary um, incentives, I think, more than anything else. And so once we show that it's going to cost more than it's worth, I think we'll start to see more retreat. Thank you. Um, I Until 2012, I lived on a barrier reef, um, Singer Island, on the, um, in Florida, off West Palm. And I saw all this. <laughs> all, the, all, and all the variations that you've described of solutions for the shore. So when I would talk to people, I, um, I used to, and this, you have public access legally to the ocean in, in, in that part, of, in Florida, the Atlantic coast. So I say, well, we really shouldn't be building, and you know, should be like five miles in, inland. And of course, that's not popular. I says, okay, well, how about three? You know, that's not popular um, either. So I understand that money is the loudest talker and has the most seats at the table. Um, but Going back to education, I, I think the only big piece that will ever change anything is the education of the very youngest people now alive, our children, to understand you know, what will happen and, and that they're going to take on the mantle of um, stewardship. And when they've lived with that for 20 years, they might be willing to change and make decisions that will be good. But you, you, you won't find people now to be willing to make those changes. So you have to work at, mm -hmm. at, at, at both, at all those levels at, at once in order to hope that in, in a quarter century there might be real progress. I completely agree. One thing we are doing, so education is a huge component of, of the work um, that we do, and we, we have like demonstration projects, and you know, I've done several field trips out to a living shoreline. I showed a picture of the oyster reef living shoreline that we constructed in 2012, and we bring, this is part of an estuarine uh, research reserve, so we bring children out, we teach them about the living shorelines, but we're also, we are still invested in educating adults too. One of the big things in North Carolina is to initiate, this is kind of an under the radar initiative that's mostly funded through donations and through NGOs and not obviously through our legislature right now, but um, is to start a green um, engineering or like living shoreline certification program for marine contractors and engineer, engineering firms. And that's mainly because your average homeowner will buy waterfront property, see that it's eroding and not know what to do about it, and they'll just look up, you know, they'll go into Google and find a coastal engineering firm or, firm or a contractor, call them and say, my shoreline is eroding, what do I do? And your, your average contractor has been putting in bulkheads for three decades, and they say, well, this is what you need, you need a bulkhead. And they say that because that's what they know how to build, and that's what's going to cost the most money. <laughs> and it also actually costs the most maintenance, but they're not going to tell them that. Um, and so now I've participated in two training sessions for real estate developers, landscape architects, and then engineering and contracting firms on how to build living shorelines 
and how it could potentially make them money because they could, you know, go back and help maintain the plants. Um, they can, you know, basically get free advertising through the state because they'll have this certification. So there, there are ways that we're trying to reach, you know, some of the key players, but it's a, it's a slow process. Um, again, people are resistant to change, um, but I'm still optimistic. <laughs> okay, um, we can take a break in a second, but I have the opportunity, uh, the opportunity to ask one question I wanted to ask of Anna. So um, I'm will confess to be being something of a language maven. I'm not an expert in linguistics, but I just I'm always interested in languages and how they evolve and change in humans. And what struck me was when you were talking about the whale populations, I was just wondering in the back of my mind, you know, do they learn their songs? And is there an evolution you know, over time and location, the same way you would see different language populations you know, in, in humans on Earth? I mean, does that sound right? I don't know. Yeah, so there, is, uh, we, there are several examples now that we've seen. Um, in humpback whales, songs change over time, and they evolve. And we have seen now that in some, there was an example in, off of Australia where there was a new animal that came to the um, east coast of Australia singing the Western Australian song. And within two seasons, everybody adopted the new songs. Um, wow. Clearly it was better. Um, but then there's also, there's the hip, gradual the changes. new whales and, you know, the, the, cool, yeah, exactly. the cool new whale. And, and also, and humpback song is really the one that's been most um, looked at in studies. We know there's a kind of a cultural transmission of song across the Pacific from the west to the east, where it's been progressively changing and moving its way. But recently, actually, some of the work that I'm doing with colleagues, we are finding that um, fin whales, which um, they actually have very similar, well, they have very similar um, pattern of the sound that they produce. It's just this very short down sweep. But the pattern in which they produce them, they're very, very regularly repeated. It's almost like a metronome. Mm -hmm. And what we have found is that in some places, they'll have the songs change, or the pattern of the interpulse intervals changes across the year, where it starts uh, relatively uh, fast, and then it gradually gets slower and slower across the mating season. And so all the fin whales across the North Pacific do the same thing, the same pattern. They start at the same rate, and then they all together get slower and slower. And then in Southern California, just recently, we've seen that they've actually changed their song um, and now it's a completely different pattern that just slowly, gradually, there's no longer the seasonal cycle, but over time it's getting slower and slower. So there clearly is some transmission and exchange mm -hmm. between these uh, different populations, but we don't really know a whole lot about how that works. Uh -huh. Fascinating. Okay, so um, let's thank our speakers again. <laughs>